Okay, so uh, in the last lecture, we were looking at quicksort and uh, we looked at the loop invariant and we started doing the analysis of quicksort. Um, we'll continue on with that. And then we'll also try to do uh, um, analysis for randomized quicksort. And then we'll move on to chapter eight, hopefully before the end of the lecture. So um, if we go back to quicksort, um, I hope everyone remembers the basic concept where we're doing the partitioning. And that's the tricky part as compared to merge sort where the combination was, was the tricky part, okay? And, um, and this was sort of a, a bird's eye view on the, uh, the quick sort algorithm. And I'll be referring back to this particular slide once in a while so that you have a reference point. Um, and we looked at the loop invariant, and this is pretty much where we were uh, in the last uh, lecture, where we said, well, uh, what's the complexity analysis? And we said, well, you could take T of N, and in the best case, uh, you could divide it up into two parts if the pivot is right smack in the middle, middle of, of the numbers. And so uh, you would have this nice partition where you'd have uh, two smaller, problems to handle, which are equal in size. And so that's where the two and the two come in. And then you have uh, some function, which depends on how much time is taking to partition the, the problem. And we saw that since this is going essentially from J from P to R, so it's, you're comparing the pivot to all essentially all the other numbers or, or just one less then that. Uh, the complexity of that is given by big theta of N. Um, and uh, some of you suggested that the worst case could be when the pivot is right at one end. And so um, you're simply going to reduce the complexity by one. And uh, the, the uh, partitioning time is still going to be pretty much the same. Okay, so now, so that was sort of a, um, an intuitive response from some of you. And let's take a look at how we would actually take a, a more detailed look at this. So let's do the, uh, the best case. And so you already have an idea of this. So we'll sort of go through this fairly quickly. And in the best case, you have, you're dividing up into two equals. So the pivot is right in the middle and you're dividing it up into roughly uh, two equal size problems. Uh, it's actually not exactly equal because you're also subtracting the pivot out of it. Okay. So but roughly uh, equal size problems. And so you're going down uh, divided by two and then divided by four. And so the total, uh, the amount of work that's being done is uh, is the same. And so uh, this is a problem that we've seen several times before. The height of this will be uh, log of N. And so the total uh, amount of time, the complexity would be a big O of N log N. Okay, so this we've seen quite a few times and you can solve this by using you know, the recursive tree method or the master method. Um, and, and so in this case, uh, you simply have the following recurrence relation and we know the solution. Hopefully this should be, um, you know, you should be able to just take a look at that and you'll be able to know the answer by right now. Um, what about the, the worst case analysis? The worst case is when uh, the pivot is, uh, is not in the center and the pivot is somewhere uh, in the extreme edge. And that would happen when? What would be the worst case scenario for quick sort? What scenarios would the pivot always be uh, towards one of the two ends? You know, it could be the smallest number, it could be the biggest number. Yeah. Yeah, so if it was already either sorted correctly or completely reverse sorted. Yeah, so in, in both of those cases, uh, the pivot would be on, on one of the two ends. So uh, this is the case where the pivot, where it's already sorted and the pivot is, the largest number. And so you can see that um, you're dividing it up into not actually two problems, but actually just one smaller problem. So you're taking the pivot and you know that the pivot is now in the center. Well, know that the pivot is in the right location. And now you have to simply, uh, you know, quick sort uh, the rest of it, which is actually N minus one, okay? Because, because the pivot is right at the end. And so you have, uh, the problem is now uh, a constant or essentially no time over here. And you're basically making it smaller and smaller by one. And it goes all the way until it becomes equal to theta of one. And so uh, you should be able to see that this is essentially, this is zero. And so it's T n minus one. 
plus theta of n, which is the amount of time to compare all the numbers to the pivot. And so uh, you can see that this is simply the sum of one plus two plus three and so on. And we know that this is a theta of n squared. All right. So you can see that uh, if you compare this to merge sort, does anybody remember uh, what was the worst case complexity in merge sort? And you can try to sort of compare these two algorithms now. Yes, Kyle? Yeah. So um, quick sort, despite its name, seems to be worse than merge sort in the worst scenario. Okay. And why do you think merge sort did, didn't have this problem? Think back to how we did merge sort. Okay. And, and what are we doing, which is different in quick sort? And why was merge sort? Always, even in the worst case, it was n log n. Somebody else? Why was merge sort not n squared? Even though it's a, both of them are essentially similar in the sense that they're both divide and conquer. They're both dividing up the problem. Yes? What did they say? It didn't depend on the order list. You don't have to break it down to certain number. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in merge sort, remember, all we did was we took the, the, the size, have the same problem again. This is, uh, this is something, something the back is a week, so I'll just have to shout louder. Um, so in merge sort, essentially what you did was you took the sequence and you just divided it up into pretty much, uh, you know, uh, two, two uh, sequences, which are exactly half the size, if you could, right? So if it was an even number, you just divide up into two. And then you kept on uh, splitting them up until the problem became equal to of size one, and then you started combining it, okay? So uh, there was an issue of, you know, the fact that we have this problem that the pivot could be some number which is not dividing up the problem into two equal, roughly equal size, okay? We didn't have that problem over there. We always divide it up into almost equal size. Okay. So merge sort essentially did not have this problem. And quick sort does have this problem because we are expecting that these the pivot uh, should ideally be in the middle. Okay. But if it isn't the case, if it's already sorted or worse sorted, then you will have this problem that it actually becomes pretty bad in the worst case. Okay. So so this is not good. Um now, uh, so, so this is sort of a summary that I'll leave up to you, but uh, an interesting thing that we pointed out is that if it is sorted or reverse sorted, then merge sort uh, will, will, sorry, quick sort will perform pretty badly. Now let's take a look at some more general cases. Um, so in the general case, you can think of writing T of N as the following. So let's say Q was the, the, uh, the location of the pivot after uh, partition returned, okay? So it returns the, the location of the pivot. And so you can think of uh, the, the recurrence relation as dividing up uh, T of N into two smaller, to two, two subproblems, which are of size Q minus P and R minus Q, okay? Remember it's going from P to R. So essentially Q will determine what are the sizes of the two subproblems, and then you have a partition time, which will essentially be independent of what Q is, because you, regardless, you have to compare the pivot to all the other numbers. So if you look at uh, this as sort of a general uh, recurrence relation, and we look at different scenarios. So let's look at a scenario, which is, you might say is a poorly balanced. Okay, so here is a scenario where you have, um, you uh, the pivot is not completely at the extreme end, but uh, close to the extreme end, okay? So in other words, uh, the two sub arrays, the two smaller problems are lopsided, one of them being 90% uh, of the, the, the original and the other one being just 10%, okay? So we have this, uh, if you look at the recursion tree, we have, it's being divided up into one tenth the original problem and nine tenths, okay? Now you might think that this particular scenario, if you, do, if you analyze this, should it be closer to the, the worst case in the asymptotic analysis, or should it be closer to the, the average case or to the best case? Remember the best case was n log n, the worst case was n squared. So 
this extremely poor uh, imbalance? Should this be closer in the asymptotic sense, closer to the worst case, n squared, or should it be closer to n log n? And what's your intuitive answer? Pretty imbalanced, yeah? So you would expect it to be closer to maybe the, the worst case, n squared, yeah? Um, but, but let's try to do the analysis. Um, look at the tree and, and tell me what, uh, it, now try to think of it uh, a little bit more closely and try to see if you, if you did this partition, uh, if you did the, if you follow this recursive tree, um, is it going in the direction of n squared or is it going in the direction of n log n? Just by, you know, an intuitive sense, just taking a look at, at this, it's completely imbalanced. But uh, um, it's not all the way imbalanced, okay? So it's still being divided up by 90%. So this is always going to be uh, nine tenths. So what's the next um, uh, layer going to be? Can somebody give me the numbers over here? So this is going to be CN and it's still going to be 10% over here. And this is going to be 90% and 10% here and 90% here. Okay, so how do we go forward? Yes. Yeah, and let's just go to the other extreme. What is this going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be 81 or nine squared upon 10 squared, right? So you can see that um, you're getting a sense of this. Now, um, now, again, what is your intuition still saying? Is it still going to be n squared or are you kind of changing your mind? Or So somebody is changing their minds, why? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's one point that you're still adding. So these levels are CN, but what about the height? The basic problem was, remember in the, in the earlier case, if you go back to this particular issue, the height was actually proportional to N, right? And that's why even though the cost was still CN at every level, it was CN times N. So that's where the N squared came in, okay? Now, what about the height in this particular scenario? What do you think is the height going to be? Is it going to be proportional to N or, or something different? Remember, it's being divided up every time by 90%, okay? In the worst case, in the best case on this side. So you can see that, the, the tree is not going to be balanced. It's not going to be a fully balanced tree, right? On one side, it's going to probably end early, okay? This side is going to be probably shorter, and this side is going to be longer, okay? So you can see that I've shown it sort of uh, an, as an asymmetric tree. So the worst case, what's the, the actual height going to be? The height, remember, is measured by the, the maximum, the depth of the tree, okay? So can somebody give me an equation for, for this, for the height of the tree? So we're we going down by nine tenths and then nine upon 10 squared over here. And then uh, nine upon 10 cube over here. So is it first question is, is it going to be, is, is the height going to be proportional to N or something else? Now, what's the difference over here? So notice that we said, well, this you can see if it's going up by, by one tenth, what should be uh, the height of the tree? Okay, so it's going to be something N and to the base of something. So remember if you're dividing up equally, it was log to the base two, right? Now, if you're not dividing it up equally, um, what do you think this is? This number is going to be over here? Dividing it by 10 now. So the so the base of the log will increase, yeah? So it's going to be perhaps 10, right? So that's going to be really, it's going to become smaller really quickly, all right? Uh, on, this, on the other hand, on this side, the, uh, it's being divided up, uh, you know, very slowly. So what's the height going to be? Is it going to be proportional to N or is it going to be proportional to log N? and log to the base of something. 
And what's the base going to be? So I've given you a fair amount of hints. So you can see that because it's going by uh, one upon 10 and then one upon 10 squared, right? So uh, you can see that uh, these two numbers are sort of, you know, look at this number, look at this number. And this is going down by one upon 10 cube over here. And this is nine upon 10 cube. So yes. So is this going to be log to the base 10 upon nine of 10? Is that what your answer is? Hmm, yeah. So you, you've, you've got the answer. It's essentially going to be, it's not gonna be proportional to N, but it's going to be proportional to some log of N, but it's just that the base of the, of the log will change. Instead of being two, it's actually going to be much smaller. It's just going to be 10 upon nine, which is you know, almost close to one. It's not very good, but still it's proportional to log of N, okay? So the bottom line is that even in this extremely poor scenario, um, and at some point you're going to see that the left side of this tree is actually going to terminate and the right side of the tree is going to continue on. And so you might, you might have some values over here, which are C of CN. And some of these values are because this becomes zero. These values are going to be less than or equal to CN. But uh, can somebody tell me what would be the total order of uh, complexity for this algorithm? Okay, even in a poorly balanced case, but making sure that it's always 90% and 10%, okay? So is it, in terms of order of complexity, was it, what is it going to be? Is it going to be order of N squared? Clearly no, right? Yeah, so it's still going to be N log of N. Uh, it's just that the constant associated with this complexity are going to be very different, okay? They're going to be a lot bigger. But the fact that all we've done is we've changed the, the constants, the, the order of complexity still comes out to be n log n, okay? So, so what you're seeing here is that quicksort has this nice property that even if it is extremely imbalanced, as long as you don't have the worst case, which is that the, the pivot is always is consistently on an extreme end, it's only in that particular scenario that you're going to have n squared, but in most other scenarios, you're going to have a complexity of n log n, okay? Let's take another case, um, and this is also shown in the book, so this is the working. I've just done the same analysis over here, so you can see uh, that this comes out to be uh, pretty much what we've seen over here, n log n. It's just that the base will be different, okay? Let's also take a look at a, a, a another slight variation. So this is uh, shown in the book as well. So this shows you a comparison between a bad split and a good split, okay? So you could have some cases where you come across a nice split that it's evenly divided, or you may have a case where it's extremely poorly divided, okay? So this is a case where it's, it's being divided into two roughly equal sizes sub, uh, sub problems. And here uh, it, in the first uh, cut, it was divided extremely poorly, okay? You, it, the, the pivot was right at the end. And in the next uh, stage, it was roughly equally divided, okay? So it's a combination of, uh, of, a, of a bad followed by a good split. And this is simply comparing it to a good split, okay? So if you just go through some analysis again, what you'll see is that um, at the end of it, uh, this combination over here is simply a combination of theta of n plus theta of n minus one, okay? which essentially is theta of n, okay? So, so um, without spending too much time on this, um, you can hopefully convince yourself that, uh, that you know, if it's a combination of a good and a bad split, then the cost of the bad split can be absorbed into the cost of the good split. However, the overall result is still n log n, but with larger hidden costs, okay? Or larger hidden con constants. Okay, so it's not going to be as good, but in the asymptotic sense, um, you know, it's going to be still n log n. So quicksort has this property that, you know, worst case n squared. And if you look at um, the summary, uh, you know, you've got the worst case scenario, which is theta of n squared. The average case, uh, most typical cases would be n log n. 
Um, and this is an interesting um, you know, uh, comment over here, which is that empirical studies have shown that quick sort actually is quite good, okay? In an actual implementation, uh, and you can think about it, uh, if you look at the actual algorithm, the idea, the, the basic concept is that the constants associated with quick sort are actually quite good, okay? And the way the algorithm, it's a very tight loop, the way it's actually being executed, if you compare it to, for example, other n log n algorithms, um, uh, they're both n log n, but um, it actually empirically is better. Okay, so, so that's one of the things that you can think about why that's the case. Um, however, there is a problem, and that's the problem with most uh, sorting algorithms, that when you come down to really small numbers, okay, if you're just trying to sort, let's say four numbers, then uh, it may not be very good, okay? So you're starting off with asymptotic values and is extremely large. It may be really, it makes a lot of sense to use any one of these divide and conquer algorithms. But as the numbers become smaller and smaller and so, smaller, at some point there's a crossover point, okay? And after that point, it just doesn't make sense to use a divide and conquer algorithm, okay? Let's say that that crossover point may be you know, 50 or it could be 100 or it could be 10, what's at some small enough value of n, okay? So what could you do to maybe, you know, make the overall algorithm faster? Just sort of, a, you know, a, 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 a technique to be used in an actual implementation, okay? If you have one algorithm, which is really great for large values of n, and then you have other algorithms, it could be really trivial algorithms, you know, maybe even bogus art, okay? Or some other trivial algorithm. Or, or insertion sort. I think you've looked at insertion sort as well, one of the homework assignments. So those are really bad, generally speaking, but they could be very good when it comes to uh, really small numbers, okay? So what could you do? Uh, you know, this is sort of uh, thinking from a very um, practical point of view when you're actually coding. And I would like somebody else to also respond. So yes. <clears throat> Just speak up a little bit louder. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you just use a combination of the two algorithms, right? So you use for large values of N, you keep on doing recursion, but at some point you say, well, N has become small enough. I'm not going to do recursion anymore. I'm just going to use an alternate algorithm. Okay, and a lot of times such uh, algorithms, I mean, you could actually call this an algorithm, which actually splits it up into two different types of algorithms. And, and practically speaking, this is really useful, okay? So, um, so, that, so that's all we're going to do is, that's just a small variation. We switch to a faster algorithm for small problems. So um, um, now let's take a look at randomization. Okay, so this was the classic quick sort. We're not doing any randomization. Now we've spoken about randomization in the hiring problem. Remember the hiring problem? So what is the basic idea? Can somebody uh, you know, just remind us what is the basic idea in converting a, you know, a deterministic problem into a randomized problem? What, what is the basic idea? Remember the hiring problem? The agency, maybe the agency was uh, you know, giving you the wrong information, so you want to have control. So what did you do? You randomized, right? So all, so you basically taking control instead of um, assuming that the input is coming with a certain distribution. What you're doing is you're saying, well, I'm not going to assume that I'm going to randomize it myself. Okay. I mean, it doesn't seem very logical. Uh, sometimes here is a data which is almost sorted. And, you know, somebody is telling you some CS guy is telling you, the algorithm guy is saying, well, no, wait a second, we're not gonna accept it as it is, we're going to randomize it, yeah, right? So if your boss was listening to you and he was a layman in terms of algorithms, he'd probably fire you, right? He would say, why are you randomizing it when it's almost sorted? So it doesn't seem to be, in some, some cases, it doesn't seem to be very intuitively obvious, right? But you just wanna have control and you wanna be able to predict your results, okay? So you don't want to have the scenario where uh, you know, you, you're running into, you have an almost sorted data 
And unfortunately, in that case, you're getting to a theta of n squared, okay? And as I said, a lot of um, real world data, uh, and you can think about it, a lot of real world data actually has this particular property that's almost sorted. May not be exactly sorted. And you can think of real world examples um, that the data coming in is almost, almost, uh, you know, if you're working in a bank, for example, and people are writing check numbers, okay? So you write check numbers in pretty much the same order that you it's presented to you, right? But once in a while, your checks could get out of sequence and you, you tear one up or you use, you, you know, you put one in your wallet and you use the other one first and then you, the, the one in the wallet comes out later on. So the check numbers could be presented to the bank in almost see, uh, sorted sequence, okay? But then perhaps they need to have it, come, you know, they have to make sure that it is exactly sorted. So you can imagine that a lot of data is actually close to being sorted. So in that case, you have this problem that it's close to the, the worst case scenario, okay? So quick sort would then in, that, in those scenarios give you a theta of n squared result. So now what we're going to do is we're going to randomize the data, okay? So just to remind you, this is what we did in the randomization here, is that we just took the data and we just, you know, randomized it initially. And then we present it uh, to the same old algorithm as before. So the question is, uh, you have quick sort, uh, which is uh, doing a recursion over here. And initially it's doing a partition. It's, par it's calling uh, a call to the partition. And the partition is basically selecting, um, you know, a pivot. And, um, and the problem is that the pivot may be, you know, you need to randomize this. So what could be a good way to randomize it? Just take a look at these two parts of the pseudocode and tell me how one could actually randomize this. There could be several, several ways of randomizing this, this problem. Okay. How would you randomize it? So you have an array. Okay, the, the data in the array uh, needs to be randomized. So sort of the intuitive, the immediate response would be what? You need to randomize. Yeah, say it out loud. Kind of obvious, staring at you in the face. Need to, I just need somebody to say it out. Okay, so what are you going to do? What's a good randomization technique? Somebody, I'm sure many of you are just, you know, want to say it out loud, but you're saying it's too obvious, right? Just say the obvious. I'm going to pick one of you guys. Hopefully, he's going to respond. How are you going to randomize this? Come on. Just want to make sure you guys are all awake. Okay, yeah. Sorry? Assign it a random index. Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure if I get hearing you. So um, by assigning what a random index? Okay, so what you could do is you could, you could randomize. Well, the, the one way is what you're saying is that you could have an index um, to the array and that index is randomized. Okay, so in other words, you have another array. Okay, let's say an array B. Okay, and now let's say this is numbers uh, one through 10 and it was 10, five, two, three, whatever. And you're saying that I'm now going to generate a whole bunch of random numbers. Okay, I'm going to randomize the indices. And now this is going to be uniformly di uh, uh, distributed. And so let's say this is number uh, two, it's going to go to the second index of the original array. Okay, so what you're suggesting is that you're not actually changing the actual contents of the array but you're creating a separate array, which has a bunch of numbers. And that is uh, indice, that's a random index to the original array. I, is that what you're basically saying? Okay, the, the original suggestion was to actually randomize the actual data. Okay, so, so you could take, you could convert it into a separate array, let's say C, and you could just, you know, take each one of these numbers and randomly put it into C. Okay, so there are different ways to do it. And um, uh, what could be, um, well, well, let's keep this thought in mind. Now, just think about it. Um, 
we're trying to, is there a better technique? And I'm sort of circling, uh, I'm trying to get you to focus on, uh, on what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to select um, a pivot, which is, uh, which is hopefully picked randomly from this entire array. So do, you do we really need to go through that effort? And can I get your name? Anna? So Anna's, so Anna's suggestion has, is a good suggestion, but do we really need to go through all the effort of actually you know, randomizing the entire array or creating a separate uh, ar um, array which has you know, random indices? Uh, and all we're trying to do is get the pivot to be randomly distributed inside that array. So can you think of a better way than what Anna suggested? Yes. Yeah, so what you could do is make the pivot a random, you know, one of the random numbers inside the actual array. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, okay. So what we could do is we could take um, some random number in here, okay? Take a, 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 a random number, a pseudo random number generator, which uh, uh, takes a number between uh, P and R, okay? It's some random number, and then we simply go there, and let's say that's that's the number we make this uh, this particular number, which is randomly chosen, to be the pivot. Okay, how's that? And then we simply swap that number with the pivot because you don't really care what, how this is ordered, right? All we want to make sure is that this, this pivot is now randomly chosen from the rest of the array. Okay, so so you can see that uh, this this particular technique could actually be better. Uh, what we're doing is we we're taking i to be a random number between p and r, okay, and we're swapping a r and a i, okay, and then we're going to do the partitioning. Okay, so same old algorithm, except that all we have is an initial step. Uh, instead of actually, uh, so the other te technique which sort of Anna was suggesting was that before we actually call the randomized quick sort, we initially uh, uh, randomize the array A. But what are the other disadvantages of that? Besides the fact that it might actually take you order of n time to actually do that, right? It, it, if you think about it, that's going to take theta of n time to randomize the array. So that seems to be a lot of unnecessary effort. What's an, another disadvantage of doing that versus uh, this technique of simply uh, selecting a, a pivot which is randomly distributed, which is a uh, uh, random number from the actual array? What are the, what's the other uh, major disadvantage of Anna's technique, right? Okay. Think about is, is time the only issue? Yeah. Or space, right? So space complexity always, um, and when, uh, if, you, if you remember space complexity, sometimes we get confused about space complexity. Uh, space complexity is generally considered the additional amount of space that you're using, okay? If your algorithm is being presented with an area of size N, it, and if it doesn't use any additional space, then the space complexity is not N, okay? Because we disregard the actual data input the additional space complexity is order of constant. But in this case, if you actually use it, creating another array, um, so all of a sudden you have made, you have changed the space complexity from order of one to order of n, which is not good, okay? So those are two, uh, you know, the time is also there as well as space. So in both, both of these ways, this particular technique is, is a nice, you know, cool way of doing it. You just take the random, the strap, uh, the pivot with a random number, okay? So this is where we are. Uh, and now the question is, um, this is a randomized version of a quick sort. And now we need to do, you know, the analysis. So um, we've done the analysis, uh, you know, for several cases for the deterministic quick, quick sort. Uh, what is your intuitive feeling about the complexity of the randomized quick sort? You think it's going to be and uh, should we be talking about the best case, the worst case, the average case, or when you have um, probabilistic data, then do we, use, do we need to use different terminology? Okay, so for, for those of you who, you know, and remember we, we spoke about you know, probability and the different 
uh, you know, functions that you can have on random numbers. Um, so what would be the appropriate terminology to use if you have a randomized uh, algorithm? Should we talk about the best average or worst case, or can we talk about something a little bit more relevant to uh, random numbers? What is the, you know, when we, whenever we had a random number, we spoke about some function of a random number. We talked about, you know, the, the, what is the average called? The average of a random number was not called an average or mean. We actually had a technical term for it, which is, a, which is expected. What is the expected value of a random number? Okay. So expectations. So whenever you have randomized data, we're going to be talking about expectations. Okay. Uh, so the question is, um, can we somehow determine the expected value of complexity? Okay. Not the average. It's going to be pretty much essentially the same as the average, but we're just going to call it expected value, okay? Because there's a technique for calculating uh, expected numbers, okay? So hopefully you remember your equation. If you have a random number X, um, how do you calculate the expected value of X? Can somebody remind me what the equation was? Should know this by now, okay? So it's not going to be the sum of probability of you know, X is equal to I. This is simply the distribution of X, but it's going to be weighted by times times X. So, sorry, the value. So for the probability X is equal to I times the value the I, okay? So that's how, and you're going to uh, sum it over all possible values of I. So that's how the expected value of a random number is calculated. Okay, just make sure you remember this because sometimes one does get, uh, forget, uh, you know, confused. So um, now we're going to look at expected value of the complexity, okay? So it's a little different way of calculations. So it's going to be a little different, and a little bit more complex, honestly, because you have probabilities involved. So what do you expect, okay? Um, so let's take a look at how one could actually analyze this, okay? So this is just a, a description of, of what we just did. And we've basically uh, picked a pivot to be a random number and we've, we've exchanged that, okay? So how, do we, how are we going to determine the expected run time? Ah, it's a tough problem. Um, any, any thoughts? Any random thoughts? Okay. So how, how would you even go start you know, approaching this problem? It's not obvious, okay? Uh, so, so one way would be is to do an analysis, uh, an in-depth analysis. So you have a loop over here, okay? So you have a loop over here and this loop seems to be controlling things, right? So, the, so remember whenever you're talking about complexity, we always go down to the most complex loop inside the algorithm. Okay, so it does. So you could start off with the recurrence relations and try to come up with uh, a recurrence relation and then try to do um, an expected value of the recurrence relation. One technique, okay? And, uh, and, and things could become a little difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a different approach. Okay, so when things become very, very tough, we, we sort of, instead of going into the details, we sort of come out and look at the big picture, okay? So we're going to look at the big picture and we're going to say, well, um, if you look at the, the heart of this, of this algorithm, the heart of this algorithm is sort of in this particular loop. And in this loop, what are we doing? What's the core of this loop? Uh, we're going from, from J is equal to P to R minus one, okay? And, um, and, and what's the core of this loop? You know, can, can you identify some aspect of this loop which we could just focus on? And then we could say, well, if we knew the answer to that particular problem, then we could calculate the expected value. Okay, so we're trying to convert the problem into a different type of a problem, okay? So we're looking inside this and we're saying, can we identify some, uh, some aspect of this loop which could be used to calculate the expected time, okay? 
So it's not, I mean, I don't blame you for, for you know, having no clue as to what we need to do, but uh, it's not an easy answer. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look at the comparison, okay? So whenever you have uh, some kind of a sorting algorithm, at the heart of it, uh, there is a comparison, okay? Whenever you, know, you have a bunch of numbers, you need to compare them, okay? You need to compare them to be able to sort them. So comparison is always, uh, uh, you know, one of the key elements of any sorting algorithm. So let's take a look at the, the comparisons. And um, if you think about it, what if we, uh, if we say that the number of comparisons in this algorithm was somehow known, okay, then can we relate the, 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 uh, the complexity of this algorithm to the number of comparisons, okay? The complexity or the running time, can we relate that to the number of comparisons made in this algorithm? Are those two related? Remember, you know, we give you questions in homework assignments and other places where we say, well, what's the relationship between these two? So you need to think about this. On the one side, we have one function, which is the expected value. That's the complexity of this algorithm. On the other hand, we have the number of comparisons. So if the number of comparisons, uh, if we knew the number of comparisons, could we say that the complexity is roughly of the same, is proportional to that? Or is proportional to the log of the number of comparisons? Is it proportional to the square of the number of comparisons? What does your intuition say? If you, knew this, if you somehow knew the number of comparisons. So think about, uh, you know, whenever you have a bunch of numbers, let's say you have one, um, five, 20, 15. Now we, we're trying to sort these numbers, okay? How many comparisons will you be making? And um, is, is the number of comparisons, and remember when you make a comparison, we're comparing two numbers, right? It's a pairwise comparison. So if we knew the number of comparisons that we were making, would that give us a hint as to what is the complexity of this algorithm? Yeah, so will it be of the same order or will it be log of that? So if let's say I call the number of comparisons as X, okay? And I'm saying that T is the time complexity. So are these two proportional? Is T going to be proportional to X squared? Is T going to be pro proportional to log of N, log of X? Uh, which of these do you think it's going to be? Yes, it's going to be proportional. Yeah, so that's a good intuitive response because you can see that if, you know, when you're sorting numbers, you can tell that, you know, you, you the number of comparisons, you can intuitively see that the number of comparisons are actually going to be the level of complexity, okay? If you can somehow reduce the number of comparisons, that's going to reduce the complexity. If your algorithm is making a lot of comparisons, is going to be bad, okay? It's, it's doing an overkill. And if you think back on, you know, some of the uh, algorithms that you might have remember, selection sort or insertion sort, some of those algorithms, um, the selection sort was doing a lot of comparisons, okay? Or, or maybe, you know, some of the other algorithms. But think about it in terms of the number of comparisons. So this is, uh, can I get your name? Nishar? Okay, so Nishar's uh, suggestion that uh, the number of the, the amount of time is proportional to the, uh, the number of comparisons uh, is, you know, seems to be a fairly intuitively correct response, okay? And I hope that most of you can see that, okay? But, but you're not doing a formal proof. We, we're just sort of conjecturing by now. So let's assume that that is the case, that if we can somehow get the number of comparisons over all calls of the partition, then the complexity is going to be maybe equal to, okay? But let's try to do a slightly more detailed analysis of, um, of quicksort, okay? So let's, let's take a look at uh, the earlier algorithm. So what are we doing in, in quicksort, okay? So let's say that we took a pivot, okay? So here was the pivot. And then we made a bunch of comparisons, right? So we compared every element inside that array to the pivot, right? Then the pivot was placed in the right location. It got over here. 
Okay, so the number of comparisons was essentially proportional to the number of uh, to the to the size of the array. Okay, and then we had no more comparisons with the pivot anymore. Okay, and and we kept on doing this. So um, so hopefully you can see that the the number of comparisons uh, in this particular, especially in quick sort, is going to be proportional to the complexity. Okay, and can can somebody look at the algorithm and intuitively try to explain why that is going to be true? Is there anybody who can give an intuitive response to in in the case of the quick sort algorithm that the number of comparisons that you're making is is essentially the complexity of the algorithm? The amount of time is going to be proportional to the number of comparisons that you're making. Can somebody give me an intuitive response to that? So how many comparisons? So uh, initially we we had the first round where we made a number of comparisons, okay? And the amount of complexity was exactly equal to the number of comparisons that we're making, agreed? Okay, so we compared three with all of these guys and, we, and that's the number of iterations that we form, performed. Then three was placed in its final location. And then we uh, had a smaller problem. And then again, we had a pivot over here and we compared it to all the elements in the smaller problem, okay? So again, the complexity, the number of iterations was proportional to the number of comparisons with the pivot, okay? We did the same thing over here. We use this as the new pivot and we compared it with all these other guys. And so again, the number of iterations was equal to essentially the number of comparisons that we're making with this with the new pivot okay so i hope that you can see that the number of comparisons in quick sort is actually can be shown and maybe with a little bit more you know spending more time on this you can you should be able to prove prove that number of comparisons is actually equal to the complexity the time complexity okay and how many of you are getting it? Do, do, does anybody see that, that the time complexity is essentially equal to the number of comparisons? Okay, yeah, some of you are seeing that. So uh, that, that's good. So some of you are, are seeing that the number, the, the, you know, the, num the, the number of comparisons that you made over here, that's the number of iterations, and then you divide it up into a sm two smaller problems. Then you had a bunch of comparisons over there, and that's essentially the complexity of that problem. Okay, and if you if somehow you could total, if you looked at the big picture, you could figure out what were the number of comparisons, the total number of comparisons, then that essentially is the complexity of this algorithm. Okay, so so if you if you're not convinced of that, think about it some more and and look at you know so take out some examples, and um, and the book also talks about this. So I would uh, you know so whenever you're confused. So some of you have been asking me uh, which particular sections of the book to read. I'm not really giving you an answer because it depends as well, okay? So I don't want you to be unnecessarily reading a whole section of the book. Uh, if you feel that some sections of the lectures you're not convinced or you find it confusing despite listening, you know, seeing it on and again, uh, go then uh, into that particular chapter. Okay, go. You, you, you should be able to find that out and you should be able to go into that particular section and just read that section. Okay, otherwise, you don't necessarily have to read the book. Okay, so that's why I'm not assigning you uh, sections of the book to read. So, um, so basically, what we're saying is that we're making this statement that the complexity of quick sort is actually equal to the value, the expected value of x, where x is being defined as the number of comparisons. Over all so over all calls to the partition function, okay. So over all calls to the partition function, number of um, the number of comparisons is basically equal to x. And now x is a random number, and we have to find the the mean, the expected value of x. Okay. So we sort of trying to tackle the problem piece by piece. It's not an easy problem, but, but let's keep going forward. Okay. So the way we're going to do this. Um, not very uh, intuitively obvious, but this is how we're going to do it. We're going to denote the following notation. We're going to say, well, let's 
consider the numbers to be initially to be somehow sorted, okay? And we're going to call that sorted number as Z1 through Zn, all right? So as an example, let's say that we had in our early example where we had this particular case, which was simply a permutation of the numbers from zero to, to uh, nine, okay? So those are all the, uh, that particular example was uh, permutations of zero to nine. So in that case, we will have uh, Z1 through uh, actually Z0 to Z9 will be all the numbers from zero to nine, okay? So um, Z0 is going to be the number zero, which is going to be the essentially the smallest number. And Zn is going to be the largest number. So we sorted them out and we're giving it a uh, specific uh, value, uh, variable names. And we're also going to define a new variable, Zij, which is essentially that subset of that set, okay? So in other words, Z37 is simply going to be the numbers in this example, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, Z37 is going to be the numbers which are in the range of three to seven. Okay, if you had a different set, uh, if you are totally different, you know, you could have, for example, Z10 comma 20, and they would basically be, see, be saying, what are the numbers between 10 and 20 that occurred in the original list? Okay, so hopefully uh, everybody is, uh, understands what Z sub i and Z i j are, because we're going to use this as in the formal proof. Uh, let's go forward. So um, now we're going to in, uh, introduce uh, indicator random variables. You knew that had to come, okay? That was the reason why we introduced it. So indicator random variables are, you know, pretty come in quite useful uh, once in a while. Although you can do it without using indicator random variables, but it's a little easier to do it with indicator random variables, okay? So we're going to define xij to be simply the indicator random variable uh, corresponding to Zij, and it's going to say, well, if Z, if Zi and Zj are in fact compared in the algorithm, okay, then the indicator random variable Xij is going to be equal to one. If they're not going to be compared, in other words, if let's say uh, four and seven are going to be compared, then X four seven is going to be equal to one. Otherwise, it's going to be zero, okay? So xij is going to be the indicator random variable, which is going to say, well, are i and j, zi and zj are going to be compared within the algorithm or not, okay? It's becoming a little hairy, but uh, it's not going to go, go on. It's not too complex, okay? Um, might take you a few runs through this to be able to understand this, but, but let's go, keep going forward. So we've defined uh, X, uh, Xij, okay? So now the question is, um, how does X relate to, can, can you think of the relationship between X and um, Xij? Okay, so, so in other words, I'm saying that X is the number of comparisons. Now we've got X, uh, ij defined. So can you tell me what x would be equal to in terms of uh, xijs? Okay. This is the easier part. <laughs> so, um, so, so think about it. Uh, basically, we're saying x is the total number of comparisons. And we're saying x1, 2 is going to be 1 if 1 and 2 are compared. Okay, so if one and two are compared, then X one, two is going to be equal to one. Okay, so clearly uh, we're going to say, well, if one and two are compared, then X one, two is going to be equal to one. So X one, two, so X has to include X one, two. Okay, if X, if one and three are compared, then X one, three is going to be one. So X has to be a sum of all of these because these are indicator random variables. They, you know, summing them up has some nice properties, okay? So can you think of um, an equation for X in terms of X, I, J? Okay, so uh, let's say that you only had one, two, and three numbers, okay? So you could have a comparison between one and two, uh, two and three, and one and three, right? So X would be a comparison of one, two, one, three, and two, three. Does that make sense? Yeah, 
because those are indicated random variables. Those will be one if the comparison is made and we're saying X is the number of comparisons. So all they need to do is sum up the, all the corresponding uh, indicated random variables, okay? So uh, what's the equation for this? For the general case, it's going to be a, some of the mathematicians or you should be able to tell me, yeah? X, I, J. So let me write it over here. As summation over I, yeah. Okay. So it's like this, is that what you're suggesting? Okay, but what's the limits on the summations? Yeah, and it's going to go up till, and something like that, okay? So so uh, you can see that this is the equation that you're talking about. X is basically sum from I, from I is equal to one to actually, so here's the, the actual two dimensional grid, okay? So you can see from, if I is going from one to N and J is going from one to N, then essentially you want this shaded portion, okay? You want to be able to sum over this, and that's going to be, you're not going to compare it to itself. You're going to compare one to let's say three and then, and then one to all the other numbers. And then three is going to be compared to these guys and so on. So you can see that the summation, the limits, you can figure that out. Okay, I is equal to one, two, N minus one. And then J is going to go from I plus one and it's going to go all the way till N. Okay, so hopefully people can see how we're doing this simple summation uh, on a two dimensional grid, okay? So we've now been able to convert the, the value of X to a double summation over uh, an a set of indicator random variables, okay? Now, what's the next step? We want to get the expected value of X, okay? And how could we get the expected value of, of, of this? Well, as you know that uh, we essentially, what we can do is we can bring the expected value inside Okay, it has linearity. So you can simply say, well, the exact expected value of X is simply the expected value of this. We're going to bring in E inside, do the summations outside and expected value of X i j, because it's a random, because it's an indicator random variable, it has, the pro it has this nice property that if you just follow this, you can see that expected value of i j is, you know, because it's either zero or one. So you're going to say zero times the probability that X i j is equal to zero plus one times the probability that X i j is equal to one, okay? And this crosses out. So it's simply the, the, the expected value of any indicator random variable is simply the probability that that, that event occurs, okay? And that's true in, in general, okay? So it, it's almost, uh, you know, sort of a trivial extension, but all we're saying is that the expected value of X i j is the probability that Z i is compared to Z j, okay? So now we need to compute uh, what is the probability that Z i is compared to Z j, okay? So uh, we sort of uh, making small steps. Now let's take a look at our overall algorithm and try to see, um, can we figure this out? What is the probability that let's say you have two numbers, okay? And we're saying that what's the probability that Z6, um, well, let's say this particular number one is compared to this number, okay? One is compared to, um, is compared to five. Uh, what is the probability of those two numbers being compared to each other in quick sort? Okay. Um, somebody can figure this out, they deserve some reward. Um, so, so think about it. Uh, look, look at this. All we're doing is we're looking, we're staring at this quick sort algorithm. It, what, which numbers are being compared to which numbers in in quick sort? W what are we doing over here? Which numbers are being compared? Go back. Yeah. N log n over n squared. Okay, you're saying that's the probability that um, that 
probability that x um, i is compared, or sorry, uh, not, um, we're basically saying uh, probability that z, okay? So we're saying, what is the probability that um, z's, which, which, well, So probability that Z i is compared with Z j, okay? So these are numbers, right? In that particular array. And we're saying, what is the probability that, and just, just focus on one aspect of, of quicksort, okay? What is the probability that these two are compared at, at some point? And you've got an interesting uh, answer. Uh, and um, it seems a little complex, but, but let's think of it in a, in a more simpler way, okay? Here's a bunch of numbers. Um, when is quicksort actually going to compare these two numbers? So in this particular, um, uh, in, in this particular um, sequence, uh, are, which numbers are being compared to each other? Just right here, okay? What, what does the algorithm say? Basically says, take the pivot, compare it to all the other numbers, and then you're going to place the pivot in the right spot, okay? And you're going to break up the numbers into numbers which are smaller than the pivot and numbers which are bigger than the pivot, okay? And then you're going to put the pivot right in the middle. So the question is that in this particular loop, um, what is the probability that two numbers are going to be compared to each other? And let's say you have uh, these numbers, uh, let's say you have N numbers over here, okay? What is the probability that any two of those numbers are going to be compared with each other in this particular loop? Did you have an answer? Those numbers are either what? Okay, so, um, so include, so don't exclude the pivot, all right? So, so when we're saying two numbers, Z, Z, I and Z, J are going to be compared to each other, that includes the pivot, all right? We're just saying that here's a bunch of numbers. Um, let's say that, look at this particular part of this, all right? You have two, one, and zero. Now this guy becomes the pivot, okay? What's the probability that any two of these numbers in this particular loop are going to be compared to each other? Which numbers are going to be compared to each which numbers over here in this loop? Are you going to compare two and one with each other? Remember, all the numbers are going to be only compared to the, to the pivot, okay? So you're not going to compare two with one, you're only going to compare two with zero, and you're going to compare one with zero, okay? So the probability of any two numbers being compared to each other probability that a given number is compared to each to another number is, and if n is the length of this, is essentially what? It's sort of like one upon n, right? Because what is the probability that two is going to be compared to any other number? It's going to be only be compared to uh, another number, which is the pivot, okay? So uh, if, if, you, if you follow that thought, then here's what we're saying that Z i and Z j are only going to be compared if and if they're the first element to be chosen as a pivot from, e, from Z i j or either Z, Z i is chosen as a pivot or Z j is chosen as pivot, okay? So if any one of those two numbers is chosen as a pivot, uh, it's going to be compared, okay? If it's not chosen as a pivot, it's not going to be compared. So essentially if you want to find out what is the probability that a particular number is chosen as a pivot, okay? Because, um, uh, you know, one of those two. So, so let's go forward and, and, and take a look at this. So we're essentially saying that it could either be because Z i is first chosen as a pivot or Z j is first chosen as a pivot, okay? And that sort of becomes simply equal to one upon the number of elements in that particular portion. So it's essentially one upon N, okay? And N here is Z, uh, Z I minus 
j i j minus i plus one. Okay, so in other words, for example, if in the previous case you had, um, you know, here as I said, three, four, five, six, seven. So the number of elements is simply uh, these the the range minus plus one. Okay. So um, and because it's possible that uh, you know, it's a sum, either Z of I could be uh, chosen as a pivot or ZJ could be chosen as a pivot. You're going to have uh, two possibilities uh, that ZI is chosen as ZJ, okay? And so it becomes two divided by uh, the number of elements in that sub, in that, um, in that smaller array, okay? So um, if you've been able to follow this, um, the rest of it is somewhat of a just mathematical manipulation. Um, so we have we finally been able to figure out that expected value of x is going to be given by two divided by this number that we had earlier. Okay, it's coming out right from here. And well, um, now we're going to do uh, you know just some uh, replace. The, the limits, okay, so this is a simple trick. We simply replace, uh, do a substitution of a k is equal to j minus i, so this becomes k, and um, the limits can be changed accordingly. So what you'll see is k is going from one through n minus i, okay? Uh, now this becomes a little tricky as well. How do we do that summation? So does this sort of remind you of something that we've studied? Give me two more minutes. So one upon uh, one plus one upon two plus one upon three. If you have something like that, what is that called? The harmonic series, okay? So you sort of can see that this is sort of like the harmonic series, right? Because K is incrementing, okay? So now, since we're looking for an upper limit, we can make things a little simpler for ourselves. We're going to change the limits. We're going to make this k instead of k plus one because now k has become smaller. So we can also change this uh, equality to an inequality. Okay, because you can see that this become a little smaller. So the overall number is bigger. So we can replace this with an inequality. And we can also take the limit to a larger limit. Instead of going to n minus i, we're going to go all the way till n. Okay, now this portion you should be able to see and the two goes out obviously because you're looking for an order of complexity. So so this becomes exactly equal to the harmonic series, the inside loop, okay? So now we have the inside loop becomes equal to the harmonic series, which we already know is order of log n, okay? And we're doing a summation over n. So now you have n times log n, 